As you may have noticed, there's a catch me if you can structure occurring at the end of seminar 18. Let's see if we can track it down here in this final lecture in our series. First, I want to start by reviewing what we know so far in Lacan's proto thinking around men and women. Let's start first with men. All masculinized subjects, except one, are defined by the phallic function. That's what we get from Lacan's two prototypical formulas. What this means is that all masculinized subjects are castrated. And by that we mean limited, constrained, subjected, and subjugated within the normative codes and conventions of the symbolic. You can call it heteronormativity. You can pick your normative logic. The what, what we know about castration applies here to the field of phallic jouissance. That's what we're talking about here. The phallic function is a castrative logic. At this point in Lacan's thought, that's what he means by this capital I with a circle and an X next to it. The phallic function is castrative, which means that enjoyment on those terms occurs in a limited, constrained, subjugated fashion. And 100% of masculinized humans endure this fully, wholly, thoroughly. Now, in order for all men, for all masculinized beings, to hang together, we've seen, as a totalizing complete set, there must be one man who is left out, excluded, excised. In other words, one man who is not castrated, who is not constrained and limited, and so on and so forth. Who is this exceptional man, we asked? Why, it's the so-called real father of the primal horde, of course. This mythical, phantasmatic, and utterly impossible man who enjoys exclusive access to all women, remember that expression, without limit, without constraint, apart from castration. The logic here is rather simple. If everyone is included, no one has been left out. The father of the primal horde is this no one, this no man relative to every man. Hence, all of Lacan's riffs on the father being zeroed out in chapter 10 of seminar 18. Let's see if we can track down some of these pages. You'll note this also occurs in a sequence of conversations Lacan's having here around mathematical logic. It's on page 16 of chapter 10, page 190 of the PDF, if you want to go ahead and check this passage out. It looks like he's talking about the Oedipus complex. And then he starts talking about the necessity of zero in order to posit the successor. Zero as necessary for this series. And then he's on to the year zero, and then we get to the father. This is what we're talking about when we speak of the murder of the father. <clears throat> the idea here is that the father has to be zeroed out, subtracted a zero relative to the total count of all men in order for that count to hold together. Lacan talks about this in terms of an n plus one. What we're really looking at here is the father as that n, as that zero point. I like the n, though, as a naught, and I want you to hear naught as n-a-u-g-h-t, but also as n-o-t, because this is also the no thing, the pronouncer of castration, of prohibition, of no. This is the no of the father as well that is zeroed out in this logic, which brings us to women. <clears throat> if the real father is 0% castrated and all of his sons are 100% castrated, where do we find all the daughters and wives? Well, they're somewhere in between. In other words, they are more than 0% castrated, but less than 100% castrated. 
the field of femininity that Lacan is mathematically suggesting here is one in which women are between 1 and 99% subject to the phallic function. And the way we've read that in terms of Lacan's formulas is to say that all feminized subjects are at least partially defined by the phallic function. In other words, greater than 0% defined by the phallic function. But no one woman is wholly defined by the phallic function, which means that to be a woman is to be less than 100% castrated. Which means, if you hear me now, is that there's always something more to women's enjoyment than phallic jouissance. In addition to phallic jouissance, women in this position can access an other jouissance beyond the phallic function, beyond castration, apart from castration. So what this amounts to, in sum, from our last lecture, is that for men there's always someone beyond their experience of limited, castrated enjoyment. But for women, there's always something beyond limited, castrated enjoyment for them to experience. The logical issue here, of course, is one of universalizability. And I want you to really hear the etymology here once again. We've been talking about this off and on since seminar 14. To universalize, to universalize something, is to turn something into one, to turn some things into one thing. Universalization is oneification. Unus, one, and verse meaning to turn. To universalize is to take a collection of entities and turn them into one to oneify them. And that's really what is happening here. That's the stake that gets Lacan thinking through men and women here. And you'll even recall when he first starts arriving at the woman, he's doing so atop and in the mix with all the women. And all the women is precisely what we hear articulated in the myth of the father of the primal horde. This isn't just about a zeroed out daddy. It's about a totalized mommy. Let's be clear. If the logical issue here is one of universalizability, it's also about the dissymmetrical proportion that we see <clears throat> between men and women around this topic. It's the question, in other words, of that bull's head, that upside down capital A. And the reason why I say that this is central is that this upside down capital A has been with us from the very start of seminar 18. It's right there in the very opening chapters of this seminar. Not as this symbolic, logical symbol of universalizability that Lacan uses it when he turns it upside down. But he says as a bull's head, like any other character written in the margins of this wild seminar about writing. Here's the riff. Men are universalizable. And their universalization, like each and every universalization, necessitates an exception. This, what we have in front of us in the field of masculine enjoyment, is a logic of the all. And that's what we've been talking about. That's the relationship between all men and the necessarily subtracted, zeroed out figure of the father. The no man who guarantees the total count that is all men. With women, though, according to Lacan, we do not see a logic of universalizability. And thus, the collectivization of women does not necessitate an exception, because we're not pronouncing a universalization of them, which is exactly why in the uh, parallel formula for women, we see the upside down A with an X next to it, but with a line over the top that horizontal bar, which is one of negation. Here, the logic is not one of the all, but instead the logic of a not all. That's what that part of the formula indicates. Hence, this upside down capital A with a horizontal bar above it. That's how you would read this in symbolic logic. 